Hello, uh, welcome once again to uh, Film Crack Crack uh, with myself, Clive Davis, and him down there. Uh, Nicolas or Shenanigans. As you can tell, we're dealing with a bit of a delay uh, here in the proceedings, so that won't be the first awkward silence. Um, and uh, we have a guest curator today in the form of... Gino Cuddy. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. All right. You know, I love your rich, sonorous voice. It's it's one of the best. It's one of the best things about doing these shows with you. It's like <laughs> you bring a you bring a gravitas and like a real masculine voice to the proceedings. I wish I wish I had your. Is the word timbre? Is that the word? Is that the word I'm looking for? That just that. Yeah, it's great. Thank um, you. No problem. Um, so yes. Gino, why don't you explain to, to the viewers what it is you've lined up for us tonight? Well, tonight I figured we would, there are two films, um, that were two foreign films, uh, that were exported here to the United States as Sinbad the Sailor films. And as someone who is, I would say more of a casual fan of the Sinbad mythos, I mean, I have. I have this book. I also have this book. I have this book, which has delightful illustrations. Mm. No dust jacket, unfortunately. And I also have this book with the illustrations by Edmund Dulac. And lastly, I do have the Seven Voyages in graphic novel form <laughs> nice. as well. Hmm. Um, so I am a bit of a fan of the Sinbad mythos. I think uh, my fandom stretches back to when I first uh, heard about the character, which was uh, the Popeye the Sailor cartoon from 1936, Popeye the Sailor meets Sinbad the Sailor, in which case the character was portrayed by uh, Popeye's regular arch nemesis, Bluto. Hmm. Um, and then I started loaning out uh, books on the character from uh, my school's library and abroad, and uh, I really fell in love with the stories. And uh, and and then uh, further on down the line, I was doing research on some of the films and uh, discovered <laughs> two outliers um, within the F Sinbad film canon, and those films are the Magic Voyage of Sinbad, which was originally a Russian opera entitled Sadko, uh, and also the Japanese tokusatsu film, Samurai Pirate, which was exported over here as the Lost World of Sinbad. Um, and uh, I don't think anybody <laughs> besides we knuckleheads here have ever discussed these two films together. Um, and I think that these two films are the only instances of films being exported over here as Sinbad films. And I think it's because and uh, we can get into it when we discuss Lost World. Uh, but there's actually an Italian peplum film called Sinbad and the Seven Saracens that because of the failure of the Lost World of Sinbad was exported over here to television as Alibaba and the Seven Saracens. Hmm. Interesting. Right. I mean, it's, it's funny for me, obviously, I... So... In, in Ireland and in England, um, basically around about Christmas time, there is a tendency to just, um, they'll show any movies that were like, that are new to TV. So I can remember seeing like Raiders of the Lost Ark, for example, on TV for the first time. And you have to remember that this is a time pre VHS. So you can't just see Star Wars whenever you want. You can't just see any of this stuff, right? You have to kind of hope that it's gonna show up on TV and then sit in front glued to the box and not go and take a pee because you don't want to miss a second of it because you don't have access the way we have access now. And so one of my favorite things was around that time, they would often show the Harryhausen um, Sinbad yes. films, right? And also Jason and the Argonauts and, you know, the rest of the kind of uh, Clash of the Titans, the whole Harryhausen thing, they'd often do like like all day long, it should be Harryhausen day. And I would just like, I ate that up. I was just so absolutely happy. So. So that would be, I think probably, I mean, I might've read a version of it as a kid, like at school or whatever, but I really, the first really palpable memory would have been 
uh, the seventh voyage, right? The which is the the earliest one, right? Um, well, that's the earliest uh, Harryhausen film. I, yeah. I think the I think uh, the first feature length uh, Sinbad the Sailor film proper was, I believe, in I'd like to say nineteen forty six or nineteen forty seven. Yeah. Um, and that was, uh, let me just uh, do my research here rather quickly because I want to be certain and because I don't want to get people clarifying in the comments. Oh, no, it was actually 1941. <laughs> okay, I, I was right. It was 1947. There was a film okay. in 1947 that starred Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Uh, in the role of Sinbad and okay. uh, also co-starred Maureen O'Hara. Um and then there was also the 1955 film, uh, Son of Sinbad. Right. Um, which I believe uh, coast had Vincent Price yes. and uh, showgirl Lillian St. Cyr in it. Yeah. Um, we I haven't seen either two, of those. Well, those two Sinbad films. Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that we'll probably kind of, we'll kind of reference them a little bit um, when, we, when we talk uh Lost Voyage, because Lost Voyage seems to be more in that mold than the Harry Harry. Magic Voyage. Sorry? Magic Voyage, you mean? I I know, I fucked both up, actually. What I meant was Lost World. (laughs) I've been doing that for the past two weeks. I've been doing Lost Voyage and... (laughs) Yeah. No, uh, Lost... (laughs) Magic World? Yes, sorry, I got it wrong again. Lost... Lost World, motherfucker. Lost World is is very much in the that kind of old school Hollywood uh, mold, I think, more than the the Harryhausen stop motion uh, stuff. But I, what I was going to ask you about those more books, of a swashbuckler. Yes, exactly. What I was going to ask you about those books as well, Gino, was um. So I'm I I was wondering because I haven't seen um like a a bunch of collections like that and. I am familiar with the Sinbad, the Sailor stories in the Thousand and One Nights collection. So are they are they basically just the seven stories extracted, or is or, or are they something different? Th- those collections of stories you have there. Oh, the, these are pretty much the uh, stories plucked straight from the Arabian Nights. Um, okay. Uh, uh, stories and everything else. As a matter of fact, uh, th- there are two books that have other tales. As a matter of fact, uh, this book right here has uh, Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp, the Enchanted Horse, Alibaba and the Forty Thieves, and Abu Hassan and the Cal or the Caliph's Jest. And uh, this book right here um, has, um, let's see what tales this has. This has also Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp, the story of the three calendars, uh, the sleeper awakened uh, stories. So, yeah, again, big fan of the Sinbad stories. Now, something that's always confused me is the spelling of Sinbad. Now, there are books that spell the name S-I-N-D. Sinbad, yeah. Then there are books like this one that spell it just S-I-N-B-A-D. Mm-hmm. I just think that S-I-N-B-A-D is just an anglified version of the original spelling, but I believe the correct spelling technically is S-I-N-D-B-A-D. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, it's interesting as well, you mentioned right too, yeah. how they often bunch together the Sinbad stories and the other two most famous, Aladdin and Alibaba, because um, Sinbad, the Sinbad stories are definitely in the Thousand and One Nights, but Ali Baba and I think maybe Aladdin as well. I might be right about that, but certainly Ali Baba are actually not technically part of the Thousand and One Nights canon. Um, they're actually tales that were later incorporated into versions of it, but they're not actually stories that Shahrazad or whatever her name is. Mm-hmm. to they're they're like non canonical um Arabian Nights Ap- stories. Apocryphal yes. uh, stories. Um yeah. but yeah, but Sinbad definitely is in there. Yes. Right? Sinbad is yes. the original, yeah. Seven Voyages, um, yeah. Um although and I'm it's been a while since I watched Sinbad the Sailor and The Son of Sinbad, but but remembering and also the Harryhausen films, 
but kind well, of by memory, none of them are none of them are, I would say, super faithful to the original no, stories, no. right? Um, I'm just reading Wikipedia here, and uh, the in the uh, section under origin and sources, it's it's telling to me now. Again, this is Wikipedia. Take this with a grain of salt. Uh, but it says, uh, <clears throat> the tales of Sinbad are a relatively late addition to the 1001 Nights. Oh. They do not feature in the earliest 14th century manuscript, and they appear as an independent cycle in the 18th and 19th century collections. So, yeah. Okay. Sounds mm. right. So, um, late editions. But, yeah, as you stated, uh, none of the films have really ever uh, told the Sinbad stories proper. I would love. You know, you know how uh, they have the J.R. Tolkien Lord of the Rings and how they, or more controversially now, the uh, Harry Potter stories and how they, you know, take each story and make a film out of them. Mm -hmm. I would love if they would take each voyage of the, the seven voyages of Sinbad the Sailor and make films out of them. Like when they wind up on the, on the, uh, island that they think is an island but it's actually a rather massive whale. I would love it to see a vis visualization of that on film or mm -hmm. now digital. Um, and I think it would be rather great to see a Sinbad film in theaters again. It's just, I don't know why nobody's taking that up. I mean, these stories are in the public domain. They're great adventure stories. I think that there's still a, I think Sinbad is still a name in the pop cultural lexicon. I don't think he's completely fallen out of you know, favor. And I think it would be great. And we don't have to get into the politics, obviously, but it would be great if they actually got somebody of, you know, Middle Eastern descent to mm -hmm. play the character. Um, because, you know, all of the past in incarnations have been either white men or, in the case of one of the films we're going to be reviewing tonight, yeah. Japanese. A truly great uh, Japanese actor. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, definitely not from the Middle East. Um, so I guess I'm wondering if these two films, because of their timing, are these riding on the back of that first Harryhausen film? Yes. Like, like, be like because of the success of, of Seventh Voyage, then people are like, okay, well, this has this has ships and monsters or whatever, right? Yes. Let's yeah. package this, okay. I think as well, more wide, and this speaks to what you were saying about, for instance, Gino doing the Sinbad films properly, but, you, but there are bits like the the island that turns out to be a whale for example i mean i can't think but i'm pretty sure i have seen that in something but what what seems to have happened uh yeah because of the success of the simbad films and as well are uh, kind of around the same times a little bit earlier the the italian peplums and the hercules and michiste and all those things is you seem to it seems to have become the norm to present like a weird ancient and mythological world gumbo right where it's a little bit of greece a little bit of rome a little bit of mesopotamia a little bit of this a little bit of that and and kind of no one number five yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, exactly with extra cheese please <laughs> no one actually seems to give a shit about uh the yes. specificity of it right so, so yeah so yeah i think the peplums as well were probably driving uh i'm plus both am i wrong but does, does much later on does lou ferrigno not appear in a quite a late yes in bad made, in, made in italy yeah um that is very much a peplum as much as it is a sinbad film as well yeah yeah no there's a few different things over the years um but yeah maybe not a definitive one a plus as well i suppose it's worth mentioning that when these were released in the states they were kind of targeted more at the children's market right because it was it was even though the, it i think they were originally presented as all ages entertainment it was kids who really took to the the simbad films the harryhausen films right um hmm. i think they were the driving market force and and maybe for the peplums as well, ah, and maybe um, you know, in those days, unfortunately, kind of closeted gay men could go and see really ripped buff guys 
um, on screen in the Steve Reeves, Simba, uh, yeah, uh, in the Peplums as well, right? Right. Um, I do like the posters for both of these films. There's one that it's really obvious in the one for the the Toho film that the poster bears the American poster bears no resemblance to the film. Like it's right. the, the paintings of the various people are like. It just yeah you you you'd never guess this is a actually a Japanese film. Yeah. Right. Right. Um. So which which one do we want to kick off with, Gino? I think we should kick off with Magic Voyage of Sinbad, aka Sadko. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I only watched the English, the Sinbad dubs of these films. You two probably. I know you. Did I didn't. Five, I sir, didn't get to anything beyond those as well. So I've just, I've just watched the English as well. Okay. I, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, did watch all, all versions. So I'll, I'll be able to speak a little bit to, um, changes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. You'll be the bridge then. Mm. Um. So yeah, let's get to uh, the magic voyage of Sinbad. Yes. So, so this is Russian, first of all, right? Yes, um, this is yeah. a Russian film, uh, actually a Russian opera mm -hmm. uh, that was turned into a, that was adapted into a film named Sadko. Uh, Sadko being a Russian opera and this being a film adaptation of that. And then, of course, Roger Corman and a young Francis Ford Coppola, who would yeah. then go on to direct The Godfather and Apocalypse Now, actually scripted the Sinbad mm -hmm. dub for this film. Yeah, I believe which, this is one of his first jobs too. If I'm if I'm correct in that, yeah, he he was a film doctor for a few things around this time for for Common. This was released uh, not by AIP though; it was Common's uh, film group, right? And um, I'll mention this right. a little bit later, but maybe that's why having Coppola on as well, someone who kind of um, uh, you know respects his literature is it's they did a pretty good job. The the kind of uh, the Simbad imposition is not too much of a stretch uh, in this case. Um, like you said, based on an opera itself, based on uh, like a folkloric, uh, medieval epic. Um, that yeah, not a Simbad story about this um, this um, kind of uh, heroic harp playing adventurer musician right but uh yes but for all intense in the in the in the film group dub has become simbad mm -hmm. as played by um sergey stolyarov who i don't know about you two he took uh, me straight back to when we were talking flash gordon he would have been a really good flash gordon i think uh, sergey uh, yes stolyarov. he's got that that lantern jaw and the kind of the blonde yeah 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 yeah. And um, yeah, he does. Yeah. Uh, it's also worth mentioning as well in its original form, you know, from Moss film as well, right? The the huge kind of Soviet um, studio of its day that was, you know, pumping out big, serious kind of epic films. So this is yeah, this is not a um, this is not a little chintzy low budget affair uh no, no. matter what those assholes over at mystery science theater three I, that, yeah right? <laughs> i knew that would be coming yeah. up so i i decided to steer clear of mentioning that that they was can, sadly the first they, way that i saw this film they can um, fuck right off all right all right um but i, uh, to I, I will <laughs> i will say i i yes i i know um yeah, no, it, it, the spectacle is, is quite amazing. I mean, the other thing that's, it's really, it is a product certainly too, though, of its of its place and time. So for me, I quite enjoyed all the, the capitalist bashing stuff that goes on. Uh, but in the media, you're like, oh yeah, this is a film made in Soviet Russia. Um, you know, the, the kind of the whole opening part with the, the, the sleazy merchants and the kind of the exploitation of the masses. And there's, I, I was kind of surprised that actually um, Francis Ford Coppola I'm betting some of that stuff was pretty much straight out of the Russian script. Like some of that, some of the dialogue sounded very like. Yes, it is. Yeah. Didactic. And like, I was like, oh, okay. Um, they, they're not soft selling that stuff. I was curious as well, but I couldn't quite figure out, even though a lot of it is obviously studio bound. Um, I was wondering which part of the vast Soviet Union it was actually uh, filmed in as well. Some of the locations. I'm not quite sure. I couldn't uh, get a handle on 
on that. But um, no, but it is a, a beautiful looking film. So uh, what I might do here, if it's okay with you gents, is I'll tell basically what the tale is in the original. And then we can, as we go along, we can talk about what it is in the... The symbolization of it. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, the symbolization of it. It's a new word we've created. Uh, Trademark, Magic Morning Wood Enterprises. <laughs> we'll oh. be rich in no time, mm -hmm. fellas. Oh, we should we should make a filter. We should make a filter for like uh, for your devices that can put a the Sinbadization filter on everything. You could just make anything a Sinbad film. Um. Anyway, yeah, go ahead. take Star Wars and make that into a Sinbad film. There Who's we go. Perfect. Solo. No, that's Sinbad now. <laughs> um, Indiana right. Jones. No, he's Sinbad. <laughs> so, Clive, uh, what what is going on in Sadko? And then we'll we'll talk about how it's been Sinbadized. Yes. Yeah, so Sid, Sadko the Minstrel, aka Sinbad. Um, so he lives in the. So in the original, it's the city of Novgorod. Hmm. Which I think might actually be a real city. I think it might be too. Yes. Um, but uh, is it Kovosan? It's called in oh, the... Kovosan. Kovosan. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm trying to read my own notes here. But but um, does he... Yeah, so he returns to his, to his city, whatever it's called, from some kind of voyage. And is kind of disgusted to see that the people are somewhat under the yoke of the capitalists, basically, and miserable. Yeah, they're and looking he, pretty downtrodden. Yeah, and yes, as we said, Coppola just kind of kept that. They'll, they'll, yep. Why not? Um, and then he also falls for some chick he sees. He quite takes a fancy to. Yes. Yes, Luberia is her is her English yes. dub name. I don't know. I think it's something similar in Russian, actually. Although, to be fair, he's quite flaky, this Soviet Flash Gordon, because he also falls for the underwater princess, like, five minutes later. With her. <laughs> so he's just <laughs> been done saying, oh, my God, you are the only one. For Ooh, and then, you know, five minutes later, he's got hot pants again. He's like, oh, you are you are <laughs> super hot underwater woman, you know. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, he's got a roving eye. Somewhat fickle, this Sinbad, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and so the idea is he wants to, um, and again, this I think this is exactly the same. He wants to take a voyage in order to discover to to find the bird of happiness, mm -hmm. right? Um, right. Bringing the bird of happiness to the people will, um, I don't know. It, it. It just seems as if his people need oh. something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll restore the the peace to Novgorod slash Kafasan. Mm -hmm. I I I I think that you know, Clive, with your uh, plot description, I think for you, mm. you should stick to the Sadko, uh, okay, the Sadko version, and, and not deviate from that because I I I don't want to uh, I don't want to confuse people. I don't think we, because if we keep referring going back and forth, back and forth, I think that that would be confusing to people. Um, so I, I think that if we stick to Sadko for now, and then we could, you know, deviate into the Sinbadization, I think that that would be better. Sure. Uh, yes. Du duly noted. Uh, the only reason I was doing that is just because, um, it, it, simply because um, there isn't that much difference. If you see what I mean, so okay, okay well, yeah, well, I'll go ahead anyway. Yeah. So, um, I think the broad strokes of the story are pretty much the same, yes. yeah. um, and I'll do a very concise version of the basic story. So, uh, yes, yeah, so he encounters uh, a princess from the lake, um, a, a daughter of Neptune, who says to him, uh, "Well, because she kind of falls for him as well," and there's a whole thing about him catching a bunch of golden fish and uh, to fund his voyages, right? And then he goes to the people and he says, ha ha, I will catch these golden fish and prove that we are bound to go and voyage to find, you know, uh, and if not, you can 
kill me, basically, right? You could take my head. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a bit of a moment, but basically uh, the voyage does go ahead and they travel to various parts of the world and we can talk. So when we get to the civilization, we can we can talk about what, where those places are and what happens. And, and basically there's a bunch of adventures in different parts and I'm not sure if they do find the bird of happiness. I'm not sure if that freaky bird with a woman's head counts as the bird of happiness. Um, no, no, they, no, they, at least in the Sinbad version. And again, yeah. sorry, folks, that we're, that we keep going back and forth. But in the Magic Voyage of Sinbad, um, he clearly states that that's not the bird of happiness. Okay, right. Um, yes, and 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 who also has the ability to lull people to sleep with mm -hmm. her voice, right? Which oh. um, uh, Nick took me straight back to the Chellarong Chellarang film that we watched for the other uh, YouTube series that oh, yes. we do. Um, um, yes, and and uh, after a few adventures, uh, Flash Gordon gets homesick, uh, so they go. Home, um, and there's some business with with you mean Sarko. Yes, yeah. <laughs> there's a I'm, I'm confusing people even more now by referring to people who aren't even in the film, um, and uh, yeah, and there's a bit of a squabble with Neptune, uh, right. and then basically, quite literally, uh, Flash Gordon Sadko discovers there's no place like home. Mm -hmm. It is basically yes. the, the message of the... Yes, happiness was here all along. Yes, so he's gone from yes. Flash Garden to Dorothy. Yes. Uh, right, so that's the broad strokes. It's a, it's, a, it's a big, sprawling adventure with fantasy elements, mm -hmm. which uh, is, I suppose, at heart, anti-capitalist and extremely nationalistic, if you wanted to... To really uh, kind of um, take it seriously, but I think it's the kind of thing that, in retrospect, because people put it in the put it, you look at it through the lens of oh, it's a oh, it's a so oh, it's a Soviet film, oh, it's a Soviet film from the fifties, which is kind of interesting to do. But also, if you didn't have that backstory, I'm not sure if it necessarily plays that differently from a film made anywhere else really it, it oh, yeah yeah there's always the kind of the the like the the the, the hero of the people the champion the, their oppressors these yeah. things are not necessarily unique to to any uh culture or any yeah. uh political philosophy right we see them over and over again they're the foundation of good storytelling yeah um, mm -hmm. which i is think which think... is why uh, when we get to Magic Voyage of Sinbad, I think we'll we'll when we talk about the differences now, um, we'll discover that there isn't really that much different, especially in in tone. And uh, just before you take the floor, I just wanted to mention that there's a difference of ten minutes running time as well. The Magic Voyage of Sinbad runs ten minutes shorter, and I watched both films side by side as well to kind of make a comparison, and it was a bit difficult to tell because there's occasional. It's been slightly re-edited in the US form, so certain events take place in a slightly different order, not massively okay. so. But other than losing maybe a couple of extended musical numbers, there's barely anything in those. You're pretty much getting the same film. Yeah, I'd read that it was mostly music, like mostly just right, songs. Right, right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, do you want to you... jump in, Gino, and speak a little bit, and then I'll I'll kind of say, I I just I was going to talk about my, my favorite parts, but maybe be so that, but that's going to be jumping all over the place. So maybe Gino, do you want to talk a little bit about your feelings about the film, and then I'll get into a few things, a few of the things I really like about it. Well, I love this film. I think mm -hmm. that it was a I think it was a great film uh, experience. I think that uh, I mean we both watched it in a uh, full screen. Uh, beautiful print, but it was a full screen print. I could only imagine, uh, and I believe that Clive uh, could probably speak to this, but Clive, did you watch a widescreen version of this for the I, Sodco original? 
I suspect what I saw actually, unfortunately, wasn't proper white. And uh, yeah, this film would, I mean, it, it does look good anyway. You can tell it's a good looking film. But yeah, a wide HD version of this film is definitely something that needs to happen. And I mm -hmm. would happily sit through it again because, like you, Gina, I also um, thoroughly enjoyed this film in in both its incarnations it's um it's a it's a really fun fantasy adventure and i think it's an unheralded one i i, I don't think very many people really talk about this one in the pantheon of fantasy classics but i do think that this should be designated a classic because it's so well put together and mm. you're, you, as you stated at the top it's not a chintzy it's not a low budget film even though those monsters at Mystery Science Theater 3000, mm. you know, totally degraded the, the this film. And I know that Nick, you know, is, I will is I will say that it's one of the few they apologized for. It and the other two kind of sister films that are related to it, Ilya Muromets and the Frozen, whatever it is, Frozen World, or right there was um, the day the Earth froze. The day the Earth froze, yeah. So so Paul Mann had kind of bought all of those and dubbed them all and, and kind of released them as you know to American theaters. And so they did all three of those films and they were one of the very few cases where there was a bit of a mea culpa later on and they did say those films are much, much better than we made them out to be. We were unfair. So, um, yeah, not, not to mention they also, did, they also did This Island Earth, a yeah, science fiction classic for the Mystery Science 3000, the movie. The movie. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not, yeah. They can I'm apologize not all day long. Okay. Yeah. I'll shut up now. <laughs> okay, but you're right. It's, it is apologist. This, this is the way that most people saw the film, probably in the in the US, I'd imagine, outside of people who saw it when it was originally released. It, you'll um, be up, you'll be up against the wall with the rest of the capitalists when our time comes. I'm just saying. <laughs> 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 anyway, Gino, go 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 on. And I just love you know the sets that they built for this thing, and uh, and. You two may not agree with me, but once it gets to the Neptune section of the film, for some reason, and God help me, it felt like, what if Soviet Russia in the 1950s tried to make a Georges Maillet film? Because mm. it feels very much like a trip to the moon, that, that level of fantasy. It feels mm -hmm. very much like that to me. And yes. it's beautiful to look at, and I absolutely loved it. Uh, so that's probably my favorite section of the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love yeah. Neptune's Neptune's catfish or whatever it is. Yeah, that, yeah, that, I, that's the one part of this film that's kind of. Eh, I like but, it. I'm yeah. I'm a big fan of puppets, so uh, it, so I. Well, yeah, I am too. Don't get me wrong, but when everything else is so grandiose and epic, right. You know, and then you have something that looks like it came straight out of Sesame Street. You right. know, right? There's definitely a Henson quality about it, but I. I like that stuff. And so. There's a delightful, yeah. just a delightful set piece, I think, when um when uh, um Sadko gets out his his harp to play for everyone, and there's just like a there's a like a it fills the screen. There's this kind of tableau of him playing and like an octopus in the background and yes. all the creatures of the sea just hanging out and listening to him. I thought, oh yeah, yeah this is. This is this is nice. I want to be at this gig. This this looks like the cool place to be, right? Mm -hmm. As something right. quite charming, uh, quite charming about it. And I love how Neptune and his wife are bickering too. That, that, <laughs> yeah. That's the funny part of of that s section of the film too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that reminded me a bit of the kind of the 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 Zeus and Hera Hera stuff you see in later. Like you know, uh, the Harryhausen films and stuff like that. But yeah, that was right, I thought right. it was well done. And of course, let's not forget there is a exciting uh, seahorse chase as well. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. That's that was fantastic. I mean, just the, just the pure imagination on display, and then the fact that it's all mounted so well. In fact, there was every now and again there'd be a special effect that I would be like, "How the hell was that yes. even accomplished?" The one where he first holds up the golden fish. And there's these kind of beaming lights coming off of it. And I was like, yes. How was that accomplished? Was it with yeah. kind of thin wires or something that they shone a light? I was just, I couldn't figure out how it was even done. It's, and it really works well. 
everything with the bird woman is really good as well. It's, it's the attention to detail. So it's not as if you think, how do they do that? But it's the fact just that they went to the trouble of having a prop, like when they're walking around and there's a prop that kind of looks like it's, it's that kind of thing. It lends everything an extra kind of veracity, right? You're like, it, everyone, they've gone to the trouble of dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Um, that bird woman thing as well, I couldn't help th thinking of, she doesn't look a million miles from what they turn the lady into at the end of Freaks. You know, like the chicken woman. It, right. it, it, she looks a lot like her, uh, which I found <laughs> somewhat disturbing. And the, the, her whole vibe of like, you know, Princess Morphina or whatever, just like waves of like, of you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite creepy. It's it's quite effectively disconcerting when she starts to sing and put everybody to sleep. It's uh, yeah, all very mm. well done. Yeah, and then the fights were good. I liked when they fought with the Vikings, uh, or who I assume they were Vikings or Mongols or uh, yeah, they just, yeah, they just <laughs> said they went to the north, right? I think they said that in the original as well, and they meet. A bloodthirsty lot, and yeah, and India is obviously India, even though well, they do say it's India in the English dub, don't they? But yes, they, they do. Yeah, and 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 to get back to the Neptune part, because uh, I have my computer right next to me, and I'm looking at sections of the film as we're talking about it. What about the conveyor belt of like daughters? Like, man, Neptune and his wife must have gotten real busy, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. But well, oh, of, I, now I'm having visions of like how fish release large numbers of eggs and then male fish just kind of um Well that's the flip it's the good side all that squabbling is all the makeup sex, right? Oh so I, guess so. yeah. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. They have quite the bevy of yeah. um Yes, which of which uh, Flash can take his uh his choice of, obviously. And yes. could, obviously he's gonna because she's the only the princess is the only one who doesn't look like really miserable. Like all the others, it looks like they they might be pretty hot actually if they just smiled a bit. But she's like the only. All the others like ooh, like dour. <laughs> and they all yes. look kind of like the same too. I'm looking at the sequence, and they all look kind of relatively the same too. So it's interesting how they got a whole bunch of similar looking Russian women. You know, mm -hmm. to it, to put in those costumes, man. This is such a well put together film. Again, like I'm looking at it in the background, and my God, is this a beautiful film? To look, it's a beautiful film to look at. I think the acting is actually really spot on. I don't think that, you mm. know, I mean, again, if you're watching the English version, of course, the dubbing is going to be, you know, of a certain quality. Well, it's, you know, it's not terrible though. It's no, definitely no, very no. The dubbing is not terrible. Uh, I mean, the the voice acting is really good, um, mm -hmm. and uh, just everything about this. Uh, again, I, I, this is a film that I actually do heartily recommend people checking out be it if you check out sadko or if you check it out as mm -hmm. the magic voyage of sinbad um yeah i i think really one of the things about watching films of, of this vintage is like when it's this spectacle like this and there's one that you've got, you've got these like hundreds of extras and you've got this incredible set design and, and whether sometimes it's matte painting or sometimes it's you know actual built sex there's something so convincing about it to me compared to the spectacle that tends to be put on screens now where I have a hard time. My my eyes just don't buy that it's real. I'm like, how much of this is just, you know, digital algorithms putting these little people in the background and the rest of it. And when I see this or when, even when I see something as simple as and I know some people would complain, OK, animals don't get treated well in movies. But like when I see real elephants really lifting up their legs to pretend to step on somebody or, you know, like I'm just like, yeah. This is what movies were when I was a kid. This is how I could suspend my disbelief. And I find right, it harder right. and harder to suspend my disbelief the older I get, just because of the way films are made now. Old man yells at Cloud. Um, hey, I'm 27. Uh, I'm going to go on record saying I'm a 27-year-old, I'm a going to be 28 in uh, April. Uh, but I wholeheartedly agree. I love fantasy films of the 50s and 60s and uh, even into the 70s and and just how they look, how they feel, you know, the the grandiose music that you really don't get anymore, you know, the uh, just the whole epic spectacle. Even with the most chintzy of peplums, you, you get that feeling, yeah. you know. And uh, that's why it's such a shame that films like this aren't made anymore with practical effects, with actual real-life sets being built and uh, and whatever. So, 
yeah, like, again, I wholeheartedly, and we could go around the table before we get into the next film, uh, but again, I wholeheartedly recommend Sadko, a.k.a. The Magic Voyage of Sinbad. I think it's a great film. I think it's well put together, and it's a really beautiful film to look at as well. So I wholeheartedly recommend The Magic Voyage of Sinbad. And please, people, watch it on Rift. Watch it without that garbage Mystery Science Theater 3000 narration over it, mm. because it's a film that is totally undeserving of that, in my opinion. And also, it's a film that deserves a lot more love, in my opinion. I, I love that we're having several digs at Mysteries. <laughs> I, I'm almost tempted to bring up Star Wars as well, so we can fuck with that. But um, <laughs> but no, I agree. And if, yeah, uh, Sadko, aka The Magic Voyage of Sinbad. By the way, if any of you out there need any more AKs, right, just come to me. I just make them up. The <laughs> Lost Golden Sinbad Voyage, uh, anything you'd like. Um, yeah. Alibaba and the 40 Sinbads. The thing about, I, I often wonder about the the modern CGI versus practical effects debate as well because to me it's uh, it's I I to totally agree with you you know I'd be disingenuous to say otherwise that I prefer seeing practical effects but I wonder if it is to do with I often wonder if it is to do with um suspect I mean because I have seen some really really cheap bog standard. CGI effects in films that oddly enough work better that I can't send my disbelief more right. um than something more slick. So it's 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 not to do necessarily with realism. And I think it's very difficult to put your finger on it. And the other thing th that confuses me as well is because I grew up with that other stuff and the new slick stuff doesn't work for me. I wonder, is it just a generational thing with a lot of people? They now, that is their version of what I used to look at as a kid. Yes. So, but so I talk to someone like Gino, Gino's not buying it, right? That's um, true. That's true. So um, so it's a complicated one. I, I, I'm not as firmly, I, I get it. Uh, most of that. Well, 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 here's my comparison. And forgive me for this comparison, because it's kind of an odd one. Mm. But like, you know, how... I love the 1980s version of DuckTales, and I think it's superior to the 2017 reboot that they did. But at that same token, some kid flipping through channels stumbles upon Disney XD and sees that 2017 version. That's their DuckTales. And I'm yeah, not going to begrudge them for that. That's your DuckTales. Mine is the 1980 original with Alan Young. Yours is the 2017 one with David Tennant. You know, it's all upon what you've grown up with and what you're accustomed to. And, and we I, I didn't know David Tennant. Sorry, I didn't know David Tennant was involved. That guy reboots everything. Yeah. Uh, so, wow. okay. so, so what we grew up with, like, I grew up with the 1933 stop motion King Kong. Some kid may have grown up with either the 1976 or the 2005 King Kong. You know, it's all depend upon, dependent yeah. upon what you're accustomed to and what your pre particular preference is. Yes. Uh, yeah, so the only thing... The sorry, the if, the water, if I may interrupt, mm. just yeah, for a moment there. Yeah, the, only, the only thing I'll say is, so for example, one place, and this is like, this is not even like, like let's, let's take fantasy and horror and all that completely out of the equation for a moment and say like a movie with a car chase in it. Mm. I watched a movie made in Italy in 1975 with Fiat's crashing into each other and tumbling down hills. And I know that some poor stuntman got into that car, put a crash helmet on and rolled that car down that hill, mm. right? Uh, the same when I watch, you know, a movie made in, in Hong Kong in the 1980s. And I'm like, yeah, that guy just went headfirst through a window. And then, you know, I know that there was no... And so that's where, like, I, you know, I find a lot of action films now or, like, big, even even the kind of, like, the James Bondy kind of stuff, the, you know, uh, Mission Impossible, the later ones, um, they never quite work for me because there's this part of me in the back of my brain that goes, yeah, but, you know, how much of that was accomplished, you know, safely? With the harness and CGI yeah. and green screen. I mean, that's <laughs> maybe why I just I want to see people risk West their lives. lives. Maybe, I'm, maybe there's something wrong with me, but I really liked those when stuntmen were no, no, stunned. No, 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 no. No, no, I think you're absolutely right in that. I mean, that's why I prefer the B-Westerns of, you know, the late 20s, 30s, and 40s, because a lot of the times, you know, like people like Ken Maynard and Hoot Gibson, 
they were real cowboys. They they were at they were actors second, and that's what I love about you know these films is those films is the accuracy of them, and mm-hmm. and and how accurate they are to the old west. I mean, you know, a lot of the B westerns they don't have you know cowboys versus Indians or or mm-hmm. or, or these sweeping scores. No, the B westerns are always <laughs> cattle rustlers, corrupt politicians bankers you know mm-hmm. and they have no soundtrack except for the opening and closing credits but god damn it i love them you know mm-hmm. because of you know just the action and just the charisma of the on-screen lead nowadays it seems like it's interesting you know there as well you seem to have hit upon uh some honors by accident there you hit just something that just occurs to me now as well when you're talking about you know that if that's your version of it or whatever you come across first and 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 matters of very similitude and stuff like that Weirdly enough, a lot of those B westerns from the 30s and 40s, um, oddly, they have a kind of strange opposite effect where I think it takes a lot. You have to really gain an appreciation for those films to actually, like, even though clearly there's death defying stunts happening all the time, people falling off horses and wagons and almost being run over by horses behind them and all jumping off cliffs and all these all the pre proper choreography fist fights and and stuff like that um the thing is if you were to look at one of those now um you'd actually probably people wouldn't get it you'd be watching it and you'd have amazing stunts happening in front of you in the same way as they would like in a, a Jackie Chan film or a Kung Fu film or something. But for some reason, because of what we perceive as a, is a Western or isn't a Western or for whatever reasons, I think a lot of that stuff flies over people's heads. If you're, if your average viewer is watching an old B Western and they're not tuned into it, they could be seeing countless incredible death defying stunts again, again, and again, and again. And like like a film that it. we discussed. You don't see right, it. Like a just film that we oh. discussed. Yeah. There was a film that we discussed uh on a program that we were going to start but never uh, develop fully. Huh. Um and uh we we uh, discussed the film The Apache Kids Escape, which was directed by who I think is one of the worst directors of all time, who, uh, which is Robert J. Horner. Hmm. Now, The Apache Kids Escape, 1930, very mediocre film extremely mediocre but there's one stunt in that that we were both our jaws were on the floor yes jack perrin you know gallops his horse right into right off a cliff into a body of water yes you know just beautifully beautiful stunt work pre yakima canuck coming into the scene yeah yeah just like thought yeah akin to those didn't that used to be a circus trick like jumping a horse into a into a pool of water or something from a diving board but but again i'm wondering And it's interesting to me that may, uh, in earlier, when I was a younger man, that might have slipped right past me. Like I would have taken it for granted. And I don't think it's it's interesting, isn't it? Why sometimes in a certain context, some really extraordinary stuff, in in a way, some of those stunts in those Westerns land or don't land in the same way as patently fake modern CGI does. And I find that kind of interesting why that would be the case. Right. I think there's a nice segue here, actually, because um, to get to get into our next film, just because, you know, the first time I watched uh, Seven Samurai, for example, um, I I didn't understand like how they achieved the the scenes of of people getting shot with arrows until I read about the making of the film later on. And I realized that what they did was they shot people with arrows, (laughs) Um, that there was wooden blocks under their armor and yeah. they were on horseback, and somebody with expert marksmanship was having to fire an arrow and hit, make sure to hit the wooden block under their thing. And then I wonder if there's some of that in the film we're about to talk about, because some of those scenes, because there's quite a bit of arrow work near the beginning, but again... Fire me, arrows as well. Yeah, knowing that, again, knowing that that stuff's real, it just, it just heightens the, like, Jesus wept. Those stunt people and those actors in some cases... Not even the stunt people, just like the, the actual actors are like, yeah, we're gonna fire at you with actual arrows, and they're gonna they're gonna penetrate the armor you're wearing, and and hopefully we won't hit a major organ. Um, it's just amazing, um, right? But, uh, so, shall, we, shall we then go on to uh, the the great the great Toshiro Mifune's? Yes, we, we 
We better go to Gino for the bad. correct title, or I'll just make one yeah, up. Uh, what's, yeah. What are we talking about uh, here, Gino? Uh, the next film that we're going to be discussing is the film Samurai Pirate, uh, which was exported to America as by James H. Nicholson and Samuel Z. Arkoff of AIP, American International Pictures, was exported to America as The Lost World of Sinbad. Um, and uh, Clive, why don't you go into the uh, plot synopsis of this film? Okay. I, this is a, Also, we forgot to mention earlier that um, Sadko, even though it was originally made in uh, 1952, uh, turned up in 1962 in the States, right? And, yes. Right. And then this turned up, this is a 1963 picture that turned up in 1965. Although, uh, just to go back brief, I, I, apparently Sadko did get a subtitle release in the US. In nineteen forty, yeah, I read that. Yeah, just yeah. yes, and um, then came back as a Sinbad film later on. But yes, here we go. This is um, yeah, Dai Tozoku in uh, in Japanese, uh, directed by Senkichi Takiguchi, um, most famous now, I suppose, for making uh, Key of Keys, which was the fourth or fifth, I can't remember, in a spy series. Um, that was the basis for that Woody Allen reader, uh, What's Up, Tiger Lily. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so here we have, uh, uh, yeah, the great Mifune Toshiro as, um, as uh, Sakai, right? I think. Um, a, a, oh, no, sorry. It was in, sorry, in Sakai. It doesn't really matter. Basically, he's a, a, a bandit, a kind of rogue who uh, manages to escape execution and uh, and then gets together a, a jolly boatload of mates and they go and become pirates in the southern seas. Um, a shipwreck uh, leaves them... Uh, well, first he's, he's um, rescued... Well, it turns out all the crew survived as well in the end, right? But... Uh, Rescued by um well, he's is he not attacked by other pirates at that in this opening part, right? Well he's shipwrecked yes. and captured by yeah, other pirates led by the fantastic Makoto Sato, who is a uh, mm-hmm. favorite of me and the wife. We're uh, we like him. Um yes, and, and then yeah, so it basically ends up in this uh in this uh unidentified land. Uh and th- the larger kind of plot is basically a story about a kind of uh, feckless king and a prince who's trying to usurp him and get the beautiful princess, uh, as played by Miyahama, for himself. And then Mifune and another bunch of rogues Mm -hmm. uh, basically, yeah, uh, rescue rescue the land from oppression and it's all very kind of old school um this swashbuckling time. swash mm. yes that's exactly the right term you know swashbuckling adventure um like we said more in the vein of like the 40s simbad than the harryhausen fantasy simbad and once again um yeah i i took a look at both versions. I didn't take a side-by-side comparison for various reasons, but um, I, when I was watching, I watched, I've seen this movie before, but I, I I watched it again for the first time in the Japanese, and then I made notes as I was going. I was like, guarantee, because I knew the US dub is slightly shorter. I was like, ah, guarantee that's missed. That's not going to be in it. I thought, especially because this was aimed at children. So anything with the old man ogling at breasts. The boobs, yeah. Yes. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> who, who, with his old uh, man beard, and he really reminded me of the the um, the old wizardy dude in the original Dragon Ball cartoons with the scenes that they cut out for US release when he's like looking up girls. Girl skirts. skirts. And, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's I thought oh that for sure must be gone but no that's in (laughs) no that's all in there Um, and I also thought oh that bit where that guy and it's difficult to judge if he really bites a frog in half or not (laughs) and there's some other like arrows to chickens and things I thought oh that animal cruelty stuff that'll be gone but no 
that's there as well. So I'm not quite sure what the difference is between the US and the Japanese dub, um, uh, US Japanese versions, other than the dub. But again, I think they pretty much play the same uh, totally, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's all it's pretty much all there. Anything anything you want. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm guessing maybe if you remove the credit sequence from the Japanese film, that's probably a couple of minutes. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it didn't feel noticeably choppy in any way. It felt like it really feels like we're, we're seeing the whole thing just dubbed um, mm -hmm. with the names changed. Right. Credit to the dubbing job, actually. It's it's a decent dub. And the guy who does Toshir, Toshiro Mifune does the raspy, barking <laughs> kind of thing pretty well. Like That is kind of how Mifune plays those roles, you know? Yeah, um, yeah barks them right um everyone kind of jumps when he delivers a lot of his lines and it works because the english dub gives him a, a commanding voice so now i'm gonna go into a bit about my thoughts on this film if you don't hmm. mind oh, Look, this, this was a less enjoyable experience for me agreed than, than magic voyage um but i will say i did love toshiro mifune or mifune toshiro however that's pronounced i apologize to any Everybody watching. No, that's uh, perfect. But, uh, Hang on. All right. I, I enjoyed Toshiro Mifune's uh, performance in this film. To me, he 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 was like the second coming of Fairbanks in this. Um, now, unfortunately, I haven't seen anything else with him in it. Uh, but if if this is what I have to go by for uh, his performances, I'm going to enjoy future films that he appears in, mm. um, and hopefully, and. and, and and the Seven Samurai uh, is the film that he's in, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, that's been widely heralded as a masterpiece, so I'm bound to enjoy that one. Mm. Um, and Yo Yojimbo would be another thing to see, because that's the one that was remade as a uh, Fistful of Dollars. So if, if you've seen a Fistful of Dollars, oh. you've sort of seen you've sort of seen Yojimbo, and they're worth watching. Actually, they're worth they're worth watching together just to see how how. Uh, Sergio Leone kind of adapted yeah. Although the Japanese it, setting to an, Amer to an American West in Italy. For my money, though, I mean, Fistful of Dollars, as fun as it is, it's still Sergio Leone finding his feet a little bit. Yes. Slightly scrappy. Your Jimbo's oh, fucking extraordinary. It's a masterpiece. Like, yeah, it is. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. Bifune is interesting, since you mentioned him, it's worth bringing up as well that he does have a very. um very wide breadth like he's played all sorts of people at all extremely well he's definitely one of those um extremely gifted one of the most extremely gifted actors i think we've ever had like yeah. he does do this gruff samurai thing a lot and i think yeah. that people remember him for but he he had a wider scope yeah but he could do a lot of mm -hmm. he could do a lot of different things it's surprising in a way to see him in a film like this, which is which is more matinee, yeah, yeah, you know, than than what I normally would associate him with. But um, but anyway, go ahead, Gina. We kind of we kind of interrupted you. You were talking about just generally the film. Yeah, I mean this this was kind of a hard watch for me, if I'm being honest, um, and. Uh, Maybe it's because of my sleep apnea, but I found the story a, a little hard to follow, a little bit, you know, with, mm. with how they jumbled it in the, in the American dub. Um, perhaps if I had watched the Samurai Pirate version, it would have been a lot better because I have to say this. I, even though Toshiro Mifune is a fantastic actor and I heavily enjoyed his performance, I'm not really buying him as Sinbad. <laughs> no. um, right. And, right. Fair and uh, so that's what, you know, uh, I had to sort of like take my goggles off for that one and, and really try to immerse myself into this world. And this is totally unlike any Sinbad story I've ever, you know, ever read about or anything. The fantasy, you know, aspect is really down to like the witch and the magical perverted wizard. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it, it's really just down to them. There's really no other fantasy this is really just you know an old class old classic tokusatsu film mm -hmm. so you know yeah the, the wizard as well as played by um uh ichiro arishima right is yeah as yeah when he manages to transform himself into a fly 
first thing he's doing is landing on some cleavage. That's what he's. Oh yeah. That's what he uses his powers <laughs> for. And I'm not blaming the man. I'm just saying that's <laughs> what he does. And and you mentioned uh, Granny the Witch as well, uh, played by Hideo Amamoto. Uh, mm. The witch is a lot of fun as well, it has to be said. With great teeth, the, the one that kind of comes out and the one that goes up. Right. Right, so, right. right. But yeah, like you said, other than those kind of slightly more stock characters in, in it doesn't go, there's no monsters. No. There's no. A, you know, there's nothing like that in here. And yeah, it's less of a, a, a fit for the Simbad template than than Sadko was. And I agree with you as well, Gina, of the two, this is the certainly the lesser film. It's just it's a lot I don't know, it's it's not bad, but it's it's just very no. gentle, kind of lighthearted. Fantasy matinee, yeah, yeah, it is. Plus, isn't it? And I would agree. I don't think I don't think it was necessary because you were tired. I do think there was a little a bit of convoluted plotting with regards to double crosses and who each sort of set of characters are in this machination to take over this government. It was it was a bit less clear than it maybe could have been. Um, I think this film would have worked better as a serial. Yeah, I, and I was just wasn't that interested to be honest in that stuff. Uh, I just but. But every now and again, you know, the film would do things that I really didn't expect it to do. One of them would be uh, when the, the the captain of the guard comes out and then bites the leg off a live frog. It really did seem like that was real. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, holy crap, that just happened. Um, and uh, and then I also love the guy who plays the Black Pirate, uh, you know, uh, Makoto Sato, with this kind of bowl cut fringe. And he always seems a bit like he's, he's he came from... If there's a part of Japan where people who look like Charles Bronson are from, he's from where <laughs> <laughs> whatever part of Japan that is. Uh, oh, Bronson Jima, you mean? <laughs> yes, that's the one, Bronson Island, yeah. But it's funny as well. I, I, I've said this a million times before, and, I, and people are sick of hearing it, but I'll, I say it every single time. I can't help myself. In an alternative universe, Makoto Sato would have been the live action Lupin the Third. He's. Perfect. He's the perfect okay. look for without the mustache that he's got here. But um Right. Um also perked up whenever Kumi Mizuno is on screen, the leader yeah. of the bandit um Yes. Bandits, um, yes. Familiar he was quite a cutie. Godzilla and, I, and then and then whoever it was that played the the one that our, our leching wizard is perving over at the beginning with her bountiful cleavage kind of spilling out. Oh yeah. I was I was happy whenever she was on screen as That's, well. That's uh, Akiko Wakamashi. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, she was she was fantastic. Well, it's interesting as well. So as a kind of um, follow up, uh, we should mention as well that the effect, even though there's no monster, there's miniatures and stuff, and this is all, of course, uh, Eiji Subaraya, the the yeah. effects wizards. Uh, yeah, the the effects in this are, are well done and up and up to par with, I think, some of his best. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what I was going to say is, so there's kind of a, not a sequel, but there's kind of a, a follow-up to this film. So oh, the nice. same director, uh, the same star, and a lot of the same, no, no Kumi Mizuno, unfortunately, but I think Miyahama, Wakabashi, um, Sato, Aramoto, Reshima, the, um, uh, Otakeshi Shimura is in this as well, speaking of um, Kurosawa's other star. Okay, yeah. The, the mm -hmm. face, Takeshi Shimura plays the king um um they made a in 1966 so there's a film called adventure in kigan castle which is obviously oh, they went back oh. to, the, to the well and i think it's from mifune's own production company working in tandem with toho as well and they actually went to iran to shoot it if i remember correctly and right. again, it's a kind of arabian night style adventure um a part of it is part of the whole run melos kind of story and um yeah very much similar to this in you know yeah it's kind of okay it's fine <laughs> yeah it's okay but it, it's probably about the same amount so if you did particularly enjoy the lost magic samurai world of simbad as i'll be calling it calling it um <laughs> then you might want to check out um adventure in uh, Kigan Castle as well, um, which I don't think was ever prepared in any English dub, but uh, okay. yeah. And so here's just one uh, 
not really important question, but in the English dub, it seemed like they were intimating that they were in Thailand, maybe. And is there, it was that different in the Japanese dub? Like, I mean, it, you know, it, it, I, I swear that they said Thai or Thai prince or, and then I felt like. There is a Thai prince character because he gets fucked up by the bandits, right? There's yes, a yeah, yeah. There's like yeah, a handsome yeah. Thai prince who comes over. Yeah. But, he, but he's from Thailand, right? So he would. Right. Okay. So they're yeah. not in. Okay. Yeah. So they where just, the hell are they? They just say okay. in the southern, Southeast Asia in general, I think, is exotic okay. Southeast Asia, right? And, All right. and that's about it. Um, yeah, it's normal. I mean, the thing is, it does look, it's it's nothing like, it's got nothing like the level of spectacle of, of you know, um, uh, Voyage, but like it is, it's still pretty nice. It's a nice looking film. It's it's well shot. Yeah, it's, yeah. Well, it's tall, right? right? I mean, then yeah. you can't go wrong with all those people working on your film, right? Um mm -hmm. Again, probably going on only you know, only two hours sleep a night. Um, yeah. but as we've discovered, Nick demands your blood, sweat, and tears, or otherwise he won't watch your film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you're not risking life and limb, I don't want to see your movie. Um, get out there and, and take some chances. I, I'm I mean, actually what I'm doing is as I'm hiding behind Nick and throwing out some virtue signaling from behind him, but actually secretly thoroughly agreeing with him the whole time. <laughs> An old trick I I picked it up in well, Bali all, when I was there. All, all three of us have watched, um, I believe, what uh, Fatal Deviation, you know, the Irish uh, martial arts film, right? And even oh, there, yes. you know, um, think about think about think about the madness that you see in that film, shot on video in you know the rural Ireland, right? You know, people are taking real chances. That yeah. guy who fell over the wall was very. Oh upset. my god, he, he fell off remember. a he fell off an entire wall uh, uh, a foot off the ground the poor man but you know, but, but doing that again legitimately though our star really does do some crazy stunts for a guy who's just doing his own thing in the middle of nowhere so you know yes yeah, i feel like if you're making a real movie you know take some chances let's see something crazy um right right you know um, um but I'm, right, so, anyway I, I have to say yeah. i thoroughly enjoyed oh there we go that's my catchphrase right so yes. i thoroughly enjoyed I did, I actually enjoyed both the films quite a bit, but I I'm gonna I'll side with you today, both of you, in saying that that uh, that Sadko definitely takes the takes the prize uh, for for imported films that aren't Sinbad movies that got Sinbad Sinbadized was that yes Sinbadized yeah see 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 you know if we work hard we can we can tempt Nick away from those horrible people over at Mystery Science I haven't watched yeah. that. Years, gentlemen. Also worth mentioning when uh, the Lost Magic Pirate World Voyage of Simbad played in the US, uh, it was on a double bill with War of the Zombies, that strange Peplum film. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So that sounds that would have been a that would have been, that would have been fun, bill. especially a drive-in. I think. Yeah, uh, you know, I've um, have we talked about this before? Do you know are there are there and many drive-ins down in in Connecticut where you are? Very few, and okay, like one of them is mostly for flea markets now, and another one was started to count the videos. Well, but, would yeah. would it have once been a thriving drive-in territory? Though? I I wouldn't say that. I, I I can't speak on that. My mother could probably, but I okay. can't speak on that. Okay. I mean, I'm assuming we have, we have one here, and it's so it's been it's it's a great pleasure to me in the summertime when it's open to just be able to see a film. I just wish they would bring in more old stuff. It's kind of disappointing that I still have to watch the same old, you know, Disney yeah. or whatever it is, you know, uh, Marvel things. I mean, which I'm fine with, but like I I love to see something from the '60s or '70s or '50s. Yeah, see the Ten right. Commandments. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, you're so much classier than me, Gina. My yeah. mind went straight. Actually, to I was. I want to see Lucio. the Adamson film. I, I, yeah, yeah, and I might want to see like, Lucio, <laughs> Lucio Fulci, you know, somebody getting a splinter in their eyeball uh, on the big screen. Uh, but anyway. Right, so I think, uh, yeah, I think yeah. we're all sinned badded out, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, thanks, thanks, Gino, for, yeah, thanks, for curating this uh, interesting mm -hmm. double bill. I think that was, uh, I was worthwhile. It wouldn't have been an idea that would have occurred to me, so... Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's it's always a pleasure to have you on, Gino. So 
thanks for being yeah, here. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to come on and, and, and uh, talk to you guys about this stuff. Yeah, well, you know, open invitation anytime. Mm. Uh, yep. let, us, let us know when you want to talk some more uh, crack, crack based films. Uh, no, that's crack, not wait, crack based films. Yes, well, you know what I mean. <laughs> All right. Anyway, until next time when we're back down the crack, it's been uh, me, Clive Davis, him, uh, Nick, and Gino. A little oh. bit of Greek in my life, a little bit of Italy in my life, a little bit of Mediterranean in my <laughs> life, a little bit of Thailand in my life. Mambo number five. <laughs>